today I want us to talk about the nature of a radical faith. The kind of faith we need for our day. The kind of faith that will bring that trusting and that obedience. The kind of faith happiness in Jesus. It must be a radical kind of faith. Its nature is radical. Its nature is radical. If, it's, if it is radical, then it will bring renewal in our lives. We will not be a boring people. We will not be a boring Christian. We will not talk like the rest of the world talks. Because our mouths and our tongue are assaulted with this kind of faith. It's radical faith. Our Christian lives will be full of joy even amidst difficulties and sadness and mourning. Abundant joy that, it, that should be characterized by the by the children of God. We have seen that repentance and faith is the key that ensures that our continued journey as God's people is a, jo is a journey of joy, not a gloomy journey, not an empty and hollow Christianity as we see it all over the place. It's not a nominal and compromised life. As we find it all over, the pray, all over the place, people claim to be Christians, but when you come close and you want to quickly inspect that Christian life, you find there is nothing. It is hollow. It is empty. There is no Jesus. We can sing about Jesus. We can talk about Jesus. But when, when people come close, they realize that your life smells. Your life stinks. Your life doesn't have Jesus. It's empty. It's horror. It's not characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Instead of that, what do we find? We find that a life that is, that is fleshly, characterized by impurity and, and sensuality, and idolatry, and, and sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of hunger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, hoggies, and things like that. That's Galatians chapter 5. But a life of renewal is the opposite of that. A life of true faith and repentance is critical for any Christian who wants to keep growing. And this does, I'm not talking about spiritual growth. I'm talking about growth that is holistic. You're not too heavenly sentient that you are utterly useless. You have grown round. Your growth is evident. Not just in the way you talk about Jesus, but even the way you talk about people. Not just in the way you dress, but also the way you walk. In your office. Not just the way you, you sing and read the Bible. But also the way you spend your money. Jesus must be evident. Everywhere. Holistic. It cannot just be a Jesus whom I love so much with my heart. But my mind is far away from his will. My heart is not concerned with his purposes. They cannot, that is not following Jesus. That is not true faith. That is the faith that we have called to expose and condemn and align it with the word of God. And so we have spent quite a lot of time talking about that repentance. We have redefined repentance. We have reworked it. We have understood it from a different perspective. And in the last few Sundays, we have tried to talk about faith because faith and repentance are... The two signs of this coin we call renewal. We have spent uh, about two, two, three Sundays now talking about faith. Trying to look, look, to look at the seven signs in the gospel of John. What do they say about Jesus? And what our response of faith should look like. 
And if you remember the first Sunday I said, signs in John's gospel are primarily supposed to serve as, as, as a revelatory function, to serve a revelatory function. So they are there. The miracles, the signs are there to show us something greater than the sign. The miracles that are happening there, the turning of water into wine, the healing of the noble man's son, and the healing of this man we are supposed to talk about today in the pool of Bethsaida, and the healing of Lazarus, and the feeding of the 5,000, ultimately the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are signs that point us to something greater than the sign themselves. What are they pointing us to? They are pointing us to Jesus. His identity so that we can be sure of who he is and then trust him. Trust him and obey him just like we have sung. In other words, these signs are Christological. They have Christ at the center, not human beings. So the turning of water into wine was not about the wedding. The healing of the noble man's son is not about the healing of that son. The healing of this man at the pool of Bethesda is not about the healing of that man. The healing of Lazarus. Lazarus. Jesus is not teaching us how to revive people. How to resurrect people from the dead. These are signs that are pointing to who Jesus is. So that we may know him and follow him. They are symbols. They are full, full of Jesus. They are meant to interpret his identity. They are meant to call us to trust and to faith in him. So today we are supposed to look at John chapter 5. But even before we go there, I spent quite some time reading John again this week. Chapter 1 to chapter 12. The end of chapter 11. I spent, I think I read it almost five or six times again this week. And I'm, I'm just stuck there. What is this? What is this that John wants us to see about Jesus and the way we should trust in him? I read it again and again. And I, you know, I could find myself smiling alone when I see when, when suddenly there's light from that story. I could, I could find myself smiling and, and happy and, and um, my heart welling with uh, with the goodness of the Lord because, because of what I am seeing in that gospel. And so the gospel, before I go to, to this miracle, the story begins with chapter 1, with Jesus. And what is he called? He's called the Word. Right from the beginning, John chapter 1, verse 1. The Word, right in chapter 1. He was in the beginning with God. John tells us, Fortunately, that he was God. So, so, so John doesn't want to beat around the bush. He wants to tell us straight away that the word was God. So that even as we begin reading the story, we know whom we are dealing with here. The fact that John starts the gospel this way, the fact that John starts the gospel with words that echo Genesis chapter 1, it's a clear indication that what we are going to deal with in John's gospel is a new creation. It's a new creation. So in the beginning was the word. When you, when you read Genesis chapter 1, it says in the beginning, God created. And so here, John is envisioning a new creation, a new reality that is coming about. It's a new day. It's a new day for a new creation. And this is happening through Jesus Christ. The word who was with God, who was in the beginning with God, who was God himself and who and by whom everything we see and we cannot see was created. But not only that, the word becomes flesh in, in verse 14. The word, that word who was in the beginning. That word who is a little bit abstract as we read him in chapter 1 verse 1 down all the way. To verse 13, that word became flesh. He dwelt amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we have seen his glory. And that is, uh, that is so important. 
for John. The word glory, I was just about to, well, before I came from the office, I wanted to look at how many, how many times that word glory is used in, in that gospel. But the word glory is so very important for John. We have seen his glory. And this glory is glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And so here, just as in Exodus, you know, when God appears to Moses in Exodus, chapter 33 and 34, it says there, God revealed his glory to Moses. God comes, he hides Moses in a cleft, but at the same time, he reveals his glory to Moses. Okay? But how is that glory defined in Exodus chapter 33 and 34? That glory is revealed as a glory full of grace and truth. So John has the Old Testament with him in his hands as he writes this gospel. So you can see he has moved from Genesis, the story of creation. In the beginning was the one and the one was with God and the one was God. And he's now taking us to the next book in the Old Testament, Exodus, where Moses meets God's glory. And that glory is full of grace and truth. But now, at, at this point, Jesus, or God, the Father, is revealing his glory not by hiding Moses in a cleft and then passing by and declaring who he is, but through his son. So finally, the glory of God that in the Old Testament is very hidden. That in the Old Testament is a smoke, which sometimes we try to manufacture in our churches today. The glory of God in the Old Testament is finally, finally comes and lands in the earth. Finally comes and dwells amongst us. And we can see it in the person of Jesus Christ. It's what John is saying. So this is a new day. It's a day of the, it's a day of the sun. It's a day of the sun. And that glory will become the glory of the disciples of Jesus Christ because they will begin to bear that glory. And that's why we have just sung, we have just sung, Utukufu wako bwana ujae duniani kama kama manji ya bahari. How, how is that happening? Will the smoke of the whole testament cover the whole earth? Like the waters cover the sea? And, and the answer is no. That glory now in the earth, that glory now is filling the earth as Jesus' disciples behold the glory of the Lord, behold the glory of Jesus, and begin to bear a similar glory like that of Jesus Christ. That's faith. That is trust. So Jesus is revealing his glory in John's gospel. And that's what John is about, is telling us. That is why by the end of the first sign, and Lawrence dealt with that. By the end of the first sign, chapter 2, verse 11, it says there, this is the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And what? By that sign, he manifested his glory. By that sign, he manifested his glory and his disciples trusted him. Not by that sign he taught us how to make wine. Not by that sign he helped a wedding that was, he helped a, you know, a bridegroom that was, a, was just about to go into some shame because he cannot supply, supply wine for a whole wedding. No, that's not the point. The point is by turning that water into wine Jesus manifests his glory and now the disciples can trust him because they have seen who he is. You see now, the pro that is exactly, in fact, that's exactly the problem. The problem is, both then and now, Jesus does not just reveal his glory. In fact, both then and now, Jesus reveals his glory in a very obscure manner. To such an extent that the religious elite of the day cannot understand it, cannot get it, cannot come into this glory. But he reveals in such a manner that his disciples see it and they run with it. That's what is happening here. His disciples believed in him. But how many people were there in that wedding and didn't believe in Jesus Christ? Why? Because they could not see 
the glory. They could not see the glory that comes about with the, with the turning of water into wine. For them, they want to enjoy the wine. They want to marry because wine is now available. They will marry, but they will go back home empty because they have not yet met the Son of God by whom we should find faith in God. At the beginning, that's the first sign. He manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Do you know what happens in the last sign? The sixth sign? Do you know what happened? The sixth sign is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And you know, you know the story. We will get there in about two or three weeks. But right at the end, right at the end, Jesus is in conversation with Martha. And Martha is telling Jesus, you know, it has been four days. There must be a very bad smell. Of course, that's what religion does. Religion will bury you for four days. Religion will bury you for a very long time. 38 years like the man in the pool of Bethesda. There must be a very bad smell coming out. Martha tells Jesus. But Jesus tells him, Jesus tells him in first, first, Verse 40 of chapter 11, he says, um, he says to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Look at that. Right in the beginning, the first sign is done. And when it is done, the disciples see the glory of God. And Martha and Mary and the people around their home they are just about to see Lazarus raised, yes, but something beyond a man being raised from the dead. And what is that? The glory of, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, between the first sign and the last sign, we have Jesus manifesting his glory. Between the first sign, the turning of water into wine, and the raising of Lazarus, what we have there, Right in the middle is Jesus manifesting his glory and his disciples trusting and believing in him. So John's gospel is a gospel of glory. But that glory is not just for our celebration. It's not just for our enjoyment. That glory, when we see it, we should turn our face. We should repent. We should turn away from our ways of lives. We should turn away from the, the kind of life we live without Jesus Christ and come back and have faith and trust in him and walk with him and love him and love his people. That's what that glory does to us. It's not a glory that should be seen once. It's a glory that we should see daily. So even now as I share this, most of you, I pray and hope, have seen the glory of God. But even as I share this, you should be seeing the glory of God coming out from this gospel as we talk about it. So it is not something you see once. And that's why in chapter 8 somewhere, Jesus will tell the Jews who believed, he, he will tell them, he will tell them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So you can come to Jesus and quickly, quickly, quickly just accept a nominal Christianity. You are not yet Christian. You have not yet known Jesus Christ. Jesus tells these guys, I think it's verse 32 of John 8, if you abide in my word. So there's something, there's something about coming to Jesus after seeing his glory, but, but abiding in him is something else. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. The truth is not something you know once. It's something you must constantly, constantly subject yourself to so that you may know the truth. And the more you know the truth, the more the freedom. Do you see it there? And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Free from what? From religion. We will see just in a moment. From religion that comes to cripple us, to paralyze us, to teach us things that are not in the Bible. When we continue to unbind in his word, to unbind in his glory, then we will know the truth because his, gl his, his, his glory is manifested as grace and truth. When we unbind in grace and truth, 
then we shall be free. We shall be set free. We shall be set free. So these signs are about Jesus. Who he is. His identity. His works. And John, John, the way he has written this gospel, you know, you know, I think I just wonder. I wonder. I read it again and I wonder. I look at it again and I wonder. Because he is not beating, beating up the bush. He is just very, very pointed in what he is saying. Even in his description of Jesus in chapter 1. In fact, I read it and I found seven ways Jesus is described in that chapter. He is described as the Lamb of God. He is described as the Son of God. He is described as the, lab, the rabbi, the true teacher. He is described as the Messiah. He is described as Jesus of Nazareth. He is described as the King of Israel. And Jesus himself, with his own mouth, he says to Nathaniel, he says to Nathaniel, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Seven titles, right there in chapter 1. Before he even goes to chapter 2 to turn water into wine and chapter 3 with Nicodemus and chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. Already in chapter 1 he has already revealed it. He has already told us what he's going to be writing about. Seven names given to Jesus Christ. Seven I am's in John's gospel. Seven signs in John's gospel that reveal who Jesus is and what we should do with him once we understand and know who he is. John's gospel confronts a false faith. A false faith. A religious faith. That is not connected with Jesus Christ. In other words, John is telling us to repent right is to faith right. The reason why John is revealing Jesus to us is so that we may repent from our ways of knowing Jesus that are undated, that are out of sync with the scripture, that are not found anywhere in the Bible. Jesus, John is revealing Jesus so that we may repent of the images we have of Jesus, which are not biblical. They are not in the Bible. And embrace the right faith, the right vision, the right image of who Jesus is. And so, when we read and when we stand at John, what should happen with us? We will repent right and we will faith right. And to faith right is to know Jesus. And it is to be like Jesus. And to be like Jesus is to, con is to confront false religion. Not only in our communities, but in our own lives. We must be ready to confront false religion that we carry. We were taught by our Sunday school teachers, by our mothers and our fathers and house girls who raised us. And gave us a faith that is not true. We must be ready to unlearn that faith. And once again learn true faith. From the pages of this book. That is repenting right. And faithing right. Confront religion. Confront false faith. That, is, that has got no basis. In the word of God. In ourselves. And in our communities. You can't. Repent right and not faith right. And you can't faith right and remain a religious person. I want you to follow me. So John's gospel is a gospel of new creation. New realities. It's a gospel of faith. But faith redefined by Jesus Christ. A faith that doesn't remain up there in heaven. A faith that is just abstract. No. A faith that becomes flesh and blood. In other words, we must see it. Just stop talking about it. Let us see it. So Jesus did not remain in heaven forever. He brought faith down. He brought faith down so that we may see it. So that we may have it like he has it. So for a moment, stop talking about it. 
And let's see it. Let it become flesh and blood. That's true faith. True faith. And God's for us, whose heart is the glory of King Jesus. And so even the sign, this first sign of turning water, turning, turning water in, into wine, is not really a scientific experiment on how to make wine. The relationship God has with, with his people in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in, in the New Testament, has symbolically been described as a marriage. So the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And so what Jesus is doing here, he is, he is redefining the life that Jesus has come to bring about. John is about a new beginning, and marriage is a new beginning. The old must go. And give way to the new. Jewish rites of purification. Old methods. Must give away to new methods. And so the very gallons. The very gallons that are filled with water. So that the Jews can come and clean themselves. Purify themselves. The same gallons. Jesus will use them. To announce the new day. That has come. So we don't dispense with the Old Testament. But we see how the New Testament mutes. On the, on, the, on, the, on the old. And so Jesus does not bring in new gallons. No. Same wine skin. New, same old gallons. He uses them to make new wine for the new day that has come with his coming. A season of a new wine. The old is gone. The new has come. The old faith with its religious fictions and practices is going away. A new faith is here with us. Water is a symbol of the word. I was amazed how many times the word water appears in John's gospel. It is right there in chapter 1. It's right there in chapter 2. It's right there in chapter 3. It's right there in chapter 4. It's right there in chapter 5. In chapter 6 we find bread and fish and most likely there was water. And in chapter 7 in chapter 7, Jesus make, makes the ultimate cry. He stands in the midst of everybody else. It's during a day when they're having a feast in Jerusalem. He stands in the middle of everybody and he, he cries and he says, If any man that, let him come and drink from me. And out of him shall flow waters, living waters. Water everywhere. You find water everywhere in John's gospel. But water is a symbol of the word of God. What is the symbol of the word of God? Water is the means by which every man must come to know to God. There is no any other way to come to God. There is no any other way to believe and trust the Lord. There is no any other way to have a relationship with God. It must be by water. It must be through and by the word of God. The word of God must come to you for you to have the right faith. In a man who has proper faith, check his interaction with the word of God. So either the old wine skin will have to be renewed or it will burst because of the new wine. The new wine is a movement. We have spent so much time talking about the movement here. The new wine is a movement. It cannot be resistant. There will be hostility. And we will see a lot of hostility in John's gospel. As we continue to study it. There is a lot of hostility. Jews, Pharisees, scribes, leaders of religion. Of the day, they fight Jesus. They hate him. They accuse him. At some point, they tell him, you have a demon. Why? Because, because the new wine cannot be resistant. The old wine is trying to resist the new wine. But you cannot go against the new wine for a long time. You can't. So hostility. Hostility from the world is something that you will always see from people who have true faith. Let me tell you. Let me tell you this. Gospel livers. If the word you are carrying is not bringing trouble into your life with the people around you, you have not yet met Jesus. You have not yet met the glory. 
of the Lord. You have not yet seen the glory of the Lord. This word is so radical. It's so radical that when you talk about it, when you leave it, people, your friends will deny you. They will run away from you. Your parents will look at you and they will think you are crazy. Your peers will look at you and think that you have become mad. Because that's what happens with Jesus and his disciples as they embrace the new faith found in the word. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. When lastly did somebody resist your faith? When, when lastly did somebody resist your faith? Your faith cannot be resisted because it is, it is hollow and shallow and empty. Your faith is about, if your faith is about dresses and getting a new job and getting a wife and getting a husband and getting a shoe and building a house and buying a plot, if your faith is about that, nobody will resist you. If anything, everybody buys a plot. Everybody buys a dress. Everybody buys a phone. Everybody marries and everybody gets married. And there, there's no faith involved in those things. You don't need Jesus. You don't need Jesus to be married. You don't need Jesus to be married. You don't need Jesus to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. There are already so many here. What are you waiting for? You don't need Jesus for those things. You don't need Jesus to buy a plot. You can get one. Just around here in Vika. Somebody was calling me for one this week. This last week. But there are things you cannot get unless Jesus is in your life. Hey, there are not many, by the way. In fact, they are summarized by one word. Eternal life. You can go and find out how many times the word eternal life is used in John's gospel. Eternal life. So if your faith it's about your needs and the things you need, the things of the world that you need. You are still a backslider. You have not yet met the glory of the Lord. You have not yet met Jesus in person. You are still a sinner, a backslider. You still a Nicodemus. You need your eyes to be opened. And you realize it's not a wonder. Immediately he turns wine into water. The next thing is he enters the temple and he cleanses it. So Jesus walks into the temple in Jerusalem. He radically cleanses it, judges it, and even redefines it. So in the previous season, in the previous season of faith, the temple was the place where you went if you needed some faith. You went to the temple. The temple was the place where God met with people. The temple was the place where heavens and the earth met. The temple was the true place of worship. You couldn't worship outside the temple. If you, if you wanted to worship, you walk into the temple. And so people traveled from all over the place, including Africa. And they went all the way to Jerusalem to visit the temple for worship. The temple was the center of all Jewish piety and religious life. But now, it had become a den of robbers. It had become a center for prosperity theology. People were buying and selling in the same place where God is supposed to come and meet his people. So you could walk into the temple and buy anything you want. It had become a supermarket. Like today's churches. As long as you are ready to part with a few coins in the name of a seed, a seed for your miracle, you can go into the temple, bribe the priests, they could pay, they could pray for you. But those prayers meant nothing. Those prayers meant nothing. That's why we still have a crippled man at the edges of a pool of Bethsaida, next to the church, next to the gate. In fact, it's called the the ship gate. The ship gate 
is the gate where sheep that were supposed to be slaughtered in the table went through. Right there at the sheep gate, there is a pool. And there were so many pools in Israel those days for washing, for purification, for cleaning, for cooling. Because Israel is very hot. Scattered all over the place. But right there next to the temple, there is a pool. It's called the pool of Bethesda. And a cripple has been sitting there for that eight years. That's what religion does to us. The temple is supposed to bring healing to this man. But the temple, the priests, the aristocracy, the rulers have laid, have allowed that man to be there for years that are almost the years, the same years Israel took in the wilderness. So Jesus will not allow that to happen. He comes into the temple. He pours out the coins of the money changers. He overturns the tables. And then he tells those, that are, those people that are, that are in there. He takes them. He tells them, take these things away. And do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. A house of trend. He drives the worshippers away. He takes place in the temple as its king. Finally, the king of the temple, the God whom they have worshipped for 4,000 years, is here. He takes his place in the temple. But once again, hostility from the Jews. They, can under, they cannot understand the new faith. They have not yet met the glory. They have not yet seen the glory. Glory is himself right there. Glory is right there with them. The son of God. But they are waiting for the glory of, of Moses to come into the temple. In the next chapter, Jesus meets this man called Nicodemus. Nicodemus is one of the patrons of the old faith and the old system. So he comes to Jesus by night, carrying his own wine and own wine skin. He cannot understand the new faith that Jesus has brought. He cannot understand the mechanisms of, of being born again of water. And the spirit, he cannot understand the mechanisms of being, uh, being born of the word. And the new wine, he cannot understand. So Jesus reveals his glory in ways that are very obscure to those who think they have got it. To those who think they have it. Jesus will reveal his glory in a manner that they don't get it. And this is Nicodemus here. The best example. His glory is only evident to those who are humble enough to look at him and see his glory instead of looking at him and seeing the son of Joseph. And so, Nicodemus is right there. He is still thinking about his biological family. He is still stuck with the nine months. Nine, nine months he spent in, mother, in his mother's, mother's womb. He cannot get it. He's, he's stuck in rites and rituals. Nicodemus is a man of a detent faith. A faith that is not alive. A faith that is based on rites and rituals. A faith that is based on what I do and not what God has done. A faith, I want you to listen to that. Nicodemus' faith is a faith... That is based on what I can do for God. Other than faith that is based on what Christ has done for me. Two different kinds of faith. One is detent. One is obsolete. One is nothing. One is religion. One is regalism. Because it has got to do with what I can do for God. So that God may do something to me. The other faith, which is true faith, living faith, has got to do with what Jesus has done for me through the cross. And therefore, I can celebrate because he has done it all. I'm not waiting for him to do. He has already done it. And so you celebrate because it is done. But Nicodemus, Nicodemus is blind. He cannot see that. He cannot understand how he can go back to his mother's womb. And be born again. He cannot. 
So what must Nicodemus do? And what must you do if you are sitting right here and your faith is that, like that of Nicodemus? What must Nicodemus do? Chapter 3, 35 to 36. This is what Nicodemus must do. 35. 35. He must know. This is what he must know. Because belief must be based on some knowledge. Belief that is based, that is not based on knowledge is useless. So Nicodemus must know that the father loves the son. And has given all things into his hands. In other words, it is now the regime of the son. Nicodemus needs to move, to transition, to repent from his own ways. They may not be wrong. His own methods, they may not be wrong. If anything, they were inaugurated by God himself. But he needs to transition from the old and embrace the new. And what is the new? The father loves the son. And he has given him all things. 36. So that whoever believes in the son, faith, whoever believes in the son, as what? A new car. Are we reading the same Bible? So that whoever believes in the son gets a wife, gets a husband, gets a plot. So that whoever believes in the son has what? Eternal life. Zoe. Zoe life. Not bios. Not biology. Has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life. In other words, whoever has not come to the son does not have eternal life. Only the wrath of God remains in him. That's what Nicodemus needs to know. But he is so blinded by a stupid faith, a silly faith that he carries all his days. He cannot see this. He cannot understand this. Very similar to the Samaritan woman. She is hooked up in her drunkenness. She thinks that faith is about whose well you drink from, which church you go, which church you don't go. She thinks, she thinks that faith is about, is about where you get your daily bread. She is stuck with Jacob's well. She is stuck with mountains and places of worship. She is stuck with the enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews. She has been moving from one religion to another. One husband to another. Husband in chapter 4 there has got to do with the religions she has been moving from. So Jesus, when time comes, Jesus, and she says to Jesus, give me this water I drink so that I may not come back to this well. Jesus puts her on a test and he tells her, go bring your husband. In other words, Go bring all your religions here because it is time to deal with them. And she says, I don't have one now. I don't go to church. I went to free Pentecostal. They bored me. I went to gospel life. They talk too much. They, they are so academic. I went to... Which one did you go? You people. Which one have you been of late? Anglican. That's like in the lowlands. You know, I went to this. I went to that. I went to... She comes with her religion. She submits her religion to Jesus. She must do that. We must submit our religious ways of thinking to Jesus. If we are going to be people of renewal and true faith. Hello, are you listening to me? Even now, today, you must submit that which you know to Jesus. So that, so that Jesus may give you some freedom. A new freedom that comes from his new word today. Moved from one religion to another. But now she has met not only the prophet, but the Messiah himself. Who tells her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. In other words, everybody who is just involved in fake faith, in false religion, they will thirst again. Your thirst cannot be quenched because you went to church. Your thirst cannot be quenched 
because you submit to Meshach. Your quest will not be there. Your thirst will not be quenched because you sing well. Because you are a member of a choir. Because you give your tithe. Because you give your offering. No! There is only one thing that will quench your thirst. One thing. One thing. And John's gospel is about that one thing. The manifestation of God's glory by which now you can believe and trust the Messiah and walk with him. One thing. One thing. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give. Water. Water everywhere. Water in chapter 1. Water in chapter 2. Water in chapter 3. And now the Samaritan woman. Everyone who drinks this water, this new wine, this word will never thirst again. Why? Because the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman says, Sir, give me this water. Give me this water. So that I will not thirst again or even come here to drink water. In other words, Jesus, I now hear you. Give me this water. Give me this word. Give me yourself and I will not thirst again. She got it. Where, where the religious man, Nicodemus, the ruler of the temple, the patron of Jewish religion, where he could not get it, a Samaritan woman, a heathen, a pagan, got it. Got it. She saw the glory. She saw the glory. She got it. She embraced the glory. And you know what? Because of her, verse 39 of chapter 4, because of her, many Samaritans from that town, look at this. Because of her, many Samaritans from that town did what? Believed. Believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony. Where is your testimony? Where is your testimony? You know, you know, you know, you know, we don't do testimonies here unless it is one. We know it's a testimony. So if you have a testimony, you must tell the elders I have a testimony. And you must tell the elders first the testimony before you come and tell us your own things here. Because a testimony is not buying a plot or a car. We even stopped praying for cars. We don't pray for cars. You can know Angari enjoy Niyako. Don't pray Pray for prods and dedicating houses. Can you imagine dedicating bricks and mortar? We pray for people. We dedicate people. We consecrate people. Faith is vested on a person, not a building. So many believe because of the woman's testimony. And what, what, her, what was her testimony? About Jesus. Come. Come and see. A man who has told me everything about myself. Not come and see. Jesus has just given me address. Amen everybody. Praise the Lord. These are not testimonies. These are things that Paul calls rubbish. Rubbish. So if you have a testimony here in Gospel Life. Please check it. Check it. Don't come telling us you, you, you. Just, just, you know, you got a job and that is the biggest thing that has happened in your life. There are so many people who don't have Jesus and they got jobs. By the way, before you got, before you got it, someone who doesn't care, even a cent about Jesus, got it. So yours is not a testimony. They believed because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Next. So when the Samaritans came to him, now, look at this woman. She has drunk of the well. She is now a member of the new wine ministries that Jesus Christ has started. She is now a member of the household of God. She has believed. She has trusted in Jesus Christ. She goes out into our city. And the Samaritans must come to Jesus now because of the woman. One woman. Compare this one woman with this big man called Nicodemus. One woman brings the whole city to the feet of Jesus Christ. They asked him to stay. They asked Jesus to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Two days because there's new wine. There's a new movement that has just sprung out because of the faith of one woman. Next verse there. And many more. 
many more, many more believed because of his word. His word. First religion of the Samaritans was broken because there was a revelation of true faith that led to repentance through one single and controversial woman. I don't even know how that woman was able to preach to her city because they knew this woman has had five husbands. I don't know. But let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you this. When you are caught up with a new wife, you don't care. You don't care. You don't care. You just move. When, when you see when you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, your, your reputation, nobody cares about it. You don't care about your reputation. You go out there and serve God's people. But some of us, our reputation, in fact, is the entrance from which you cannot preach the gospel. You want a reputation. You want a big name. You want to keep your job. You want to keep that friendship. You want to keep that friendship. That's why you don't tell that girl, that boy, the truth. Because you want to keep that friendship. Your reputation is bigger than the glory of God. You are a nine worshiper. You are a nine worshiper. That's who you are. You have not yet met Jesus. Because when you meet Jesus, when you meet Jesus like this woman, you don't care about your reputation. The Samaritans knew that this woman had already been had been married by five men. They knew it was public. But when she saw the glory of God, went back to the same city and got the whole city converted. Thirty years, twenty years, ten years. Go and bring a city. Go and bring a whole city to Jesus. False religion is broken. And this is the kind of healing. The healing of our eyes and our minds that must happen. Because of the manifestation of God's glory. Because of the manifestation of the glory of God. That which we need. That which we must embrace. Because of that then. We will walk by faith. We will walk by true faith. We will faith right. The object of our faith is not what we need. It will be Jesus Christ. Whom we must know. And know him deeply. It is that kind of faith. Lawrence was speaking about last Sunday. That healed the nobles, the nobles man's son. That faith. That faith. That faith with that faith we have seen with the disciples when they are called in chapter 1. They, Jesus tells them, come. And they come. And they follow him. Even Nathaniel. Even Nathaniel, the religious man. Who is sitting somewhere under the, sh the shelter of a tree. And Jesus sees him and he calls. Even Nathaniel, the religious man, comes. And Jesus' mother, Mary. Even when Jesus tells her, woman, what does that have got to do with me? She still trusts Jesus and sends the servants and tells the servants whatever he tells you do it. That faith which Nicodemus cannot understand but which the Samaritan woman understands. That faith that true faith is what brings back to life the noble man's son. That faith is what raises this man who has been seated at the engines of the pool for 38 years. It is what will bring him back to life. Chapter 1, verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Bring him back to life. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach from the old John today. We have already done four chapters, eh? We're in the fifth chapter. But I'm just about to finish. Let's read this. After this, there was a feast of Jews. John doesn't care then to name the feast. But he will name the next two. In chapter 7, he is also in the feast. Passover feast in chapter 7. Chapter 8, he is in the feast. He's also in the feast, the feast of tabernacles. So there was, a, there was a feast of Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, 
They are raised in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, in which in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these colonnades lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, look at that, a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, look at this religious talk now. This is the religious talk. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And then Jesus said to him, get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now, that day was the Sabbath. Just before you move to the next one. Look at that statement. Now, that day was the Sabbath. Now, that is a problem. There's a problem to religious people. Okay, but let's read and finish. So the Jews saying to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful. It's not lawful. I don't know whether you have met Christians who talk like that. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Okay? But he has at them, the man who healed me, that man saying to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who saying to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it, is, who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crown in the place. Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See you are well, see no more. And nothing worse, nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was, this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. Look at this. This is what he told the Nicodemus. Is what he's telling the Jews now. My father is working until now. And I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more. Not just to persecute him. But to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath. But he was even calling God his own father. Making himself equal to God. So as I finish, look at this. Look at this false religion of these, these Jews. False faith. And look at how false faith does to us. False faith imprisons a man for 38 years. Next to the day, to the gate of the, of, the, of the temple. Next to the gate of the temple. Just like we have a man in Acts chapter 3. A man right there. At the doors of the gates. And he's asking Peter and John to give, them, to give him some coins. Here we have a man. Right at the gate. For that eight years. Completely paralyzed. Because that's what religion does. It renders him useless. He must lie there. Under the deception of false faith. For all those years. Waiting for a miracle. That sounds like a modern preacher today. They keep on. They keep on telling you, wait for a miracle, it's coming. Wait, wait, wait. So a seed, so that it can come quickly. It's this kind of a religion. It is this. It's stupid religion. It's silly faith. Okay? Tells you, lie there. And you lie there under the deception of this false faith. For many years, waiting for a miracle. False, false faith will say, keep waiting. My meanwhile, as you keep waiting, plant a seed. Sow a seed. And that's how you spend 10, 20, 30 years waiting at the pool of Bethesda. And ironically, the, the, the one Bethesda means house of mercy. So you can lie at the gates of house of mercy for that 8 years with no mercy. Religion is stupid. False faith is useless. We need to embrace a different kind of faith. The one that Jesus says, if you abide in me, 
and my words abide in you. That kind of faith is what will free, will free you. The house that is supposed to bring mercy to God's people now brings a curse. Multitudes of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed, they are lying there. That is what, that is what we are now having in our churches. Do you realize churches have become centers of healing? Not centers of faith. Centers of healing. So many people are lying at the gates of churches and even inside the churches and even in where they call the altars and they are coming for healing because, because the preacher has lied that I'm, I'm the healer. I'm the healer. And, the, and faith is about healing. It's not about eternal life. It's just a similar thing. That eight years. But the kind of faith that Jesus brings about is different, my friends. It's a different kind of faith. It's true faith. It's a living faith. It is based on what? It is not based on what I do to catch his attention. It is based on his sheer mercy. That's why it is called Bethesda. It's not a faith that cripples us and makes us spiritual zombies. And all we can do is to pray for our whole night and do nothing about our situations. As you walk around, you find brothers who just want to pray. Sisters who just want to go to Cataloni and, you know, somewhere else and pray into the mountains. But when you look at their lives, their lives are shattered. They look ugly. And they are boring. Some of the most boring, boring people in the church are intercessors. Because they have not yet come to understand the praise of intercession and how it is supposed to be done by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Boring life. Boring. I'm not saying people should not pray. I'm not saying people should not pray. I pray. And I pray a lot sometimes. But prayer has got its place. And faith has got its, its place. Faith in Jesus does not make us stupid Christians. It wisens us. It makes us wise. It gives us wisdom on how to deal with the world. Gives us wisdom. Faith in Jesus is based on his sheer mercy. It's not, it's not a faith that cripples us. It's a faith that renews our reason. It's a faith that gives us creativity and innovation. That's, that's why Christians should be the best businessmen. But we have left that for the Muslims. That's why the other day I talked about Dubai. And I say, I mean, I don't know whether I've met a Christian, including me, who doesn't want to visit Dubai tomorrow and enjoy the beach and, you know, see those very high skycrapers and, and, you know, enjoy the white, the white sand in the beaches and, and the hotels and, 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 you know, and the, the big cities and, 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 and shop in those big shopping malls. I would want to do that. But you know what? Those things are not built by Christians. They are built by Muslims. Because you don't need to be a Christian. You don't need to have faith to build a more. You need money, concrete, steel, cement. So we need to rise from this kind of faith that is always reaching out to get something from God. To a faith that is always reaching out to eternal life that comes from Jesus Christ. When you have that eternal life, you don't care about Dubai, Washington, Miami, New York, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Nairobi. You don't care whether you have been there or not. And when you go there, you don't come back telling us where you are and what happened and what you saw. Because those are not things that matter to your life. What matters to your life is faith that generates eternal life. That's what matters. What matters is not the car that you drive. It's not the house you live in. It's not the suburb you live in. Those things matter for people who have not yet seen the glory of God. It matters to them. And you walk about and drive around here, especially here in Nairobi, he can everywhere else, and everybody, everybody wants to ask, what car does your pastor drive? So that they may come to church. 
That's why I want to buy a small car now. So that some of you don't come because of my car. We in fact it's the other way around. Because Christianity is the other way around of how the world looks at life. It's not it's faith that gives us creativity. Where? If you are if you are struggling to be creative and come up with a business that should feed you, feed your family, and help you. Come on, wake up. Make friends with the glory of God. The glory of God will renew your thinking and renew your mind. And there you go. A business idea lands in your mind and you begin implement, implementing it. Why? Because faith does not cripple us and make us prayer senders. To God, prayer senders. Faith gives us wisdom, capacity, knowledge, power to be able to do things that people in normal circumstances they cannot do. Creativity and innovation belongs to Christians, not to the Muslims. Please hear this word and do something about it. Even now, during the times of COVID, when everybody else is struggling, Christians should rise up and draw from the faith they have in Christ and make a difference in their lives. In their lives. In their lives. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be a friend with people who are just crying and crying and crying and praying. No. 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 Wake up and do something. Draw from the faith that you have in Jesus. It brings about creativity and innovation. When there is a revelation of who Jesus is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The rabbi, the true teacher, the son of God, the son of man, the one true Messiah. Then all religious faiths and prisons are broken. Like what we see with this man. You are free. Take up your mat and go. Your mental health comes back. This kind of faith is compassionate. It's compassionate. It is not legalistic. This kind of faith does not tell you, go pay your tithe first. Doesn't tell you that. This kind of faith doesn't tell you, first sow your seeds of healing. This kind of faith does not tell you, first go see the priest. This kind of faith doesn't care whether it is a Sabbath or it's even a Sunday. This kind of faith is out there to help God's people come back, see Jesus. And trust him. This kind of faith is not based on a legal, legal code. Established some centuries ago by Moses. This kind of faith doesn't care what Moses said in Exodus. Cares about what Jesus says now. This kind of faith is not dependent on Moses. Because the true Moses... Is here the Son of God Himself? It's a compassionate faith, it's a merciful faith. And so, take up your mat and go. You need to check out your faith. Is your faith compassionate? Is your faith always going out? Or your faith is always coming towards you? You see, that's the difference. If your faith is about you and what you get by faith, by faith. By faith, even by faith, I will fly in the air one of these days. By faith, I will go through where by faith. If, if your faith is about you, it's false faith, it's religious faith. If your faith is about what God wants you to do through you and in you, then that's true faith. It will be a compassionate faith. It reaches out to others. It touches others. It touches others. I tell you the truth. You can test whether you have true faith or not. You can test and you know. You touch others with your faith. We touch, you touch others with your talk. You touch others with your money. You touch others with your life. When people are around you, they are happy. They are not gloomy. They are not wondering when you shall leave. So that they may rejoice once again. That's not faith. That, that's false faith. That's religion. When you have this kind of faith, Take up your mat and go without requirements. Without requirements. Check out your faith. 
When lastly did you touch someone? You just tell them, I love you and, and, and God is with you. When lastly did you when lastly did you buy someone coffee? Or dinner? When last thing did you go through Naivas? Or Taskis, even if it's crumbly. Quick mat. And got a few things in a pocket. And you pass through a sister who has not been working for the last six months due to COVID. And you brought them a shopping. When, when last thing did you have someone, whether they have paid their rent? You may not have the money, but when lastly did you ask someone whether they are paying their rent? When, when lastly did you see, did you go to see, to see someone in hospital? I just spent 20, 30 minutes with them. When lastly did you do that? When? But you can talk about faith, your faith. It's like Christianity is a sham. Christianity is a sham. And so many people hate Christianity because they can see it is a sham. And now people are going back to, 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 to become Muslims. Because there, things are happening. They are touching people, those guys. But us, our faith is about me and myself and I. It's very rare to find someone who has gone to Cataloni to pray for those 21 days, for their mother who is struggling with cancer. Not their mother, a sister in church who is struggling with cancer. But they will go for 21 days because they have not been married. And they want to be married tomorrow. I tell you the truth. They will go for a whole week praying and fasting for a job because they are jobless. But they cannot pray for someone else because faith is about them not about the life that comes with and through Jesus Christ, in them through Jesus Christ. Check out your faith and wake up from your slumber and wake up from your backsliding because that is religious faith. That is religious faith. That is religious faith. Religious faith is about competition. <laughs> this man says to Jesus, I have no one to put me in. And when I want to get in, someone else can in fast. That's religious faith. It's about competition. That's a religious spirit. Spirit. It has crippled him completely. It is about competition. It's about who gets there first. It's about survival. It's a, it's a survival spirit. It's a hustler faith. Hustler. Hustler faith. It is a hustler faith. Hustling. Selling chicken and everything, including plots and everything you can, hustling, not because there is life, the life of God in you, but 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 selling whatever you can sell, including selling people to make it in life, competition, and you don't care whom you step at as you go to your next miracle. You don't care. It's it's asla, asla's faith, it's competition, survival. It is not a sonship spirit. It is the spirit you find in many Christians today. Survival for the fittest. So even when praying, they think that if I don't pray, if I don't pray now, someone else won't get it before I get it. <laughs> there are people who pray with that mentality and that kind of motivation. They think, they think, they think that thing they are asking God for is the last one in his store. And so they wake up at 4 before you wake up at 6. And they claim it. And they name it before you wake up at 6 to claim it and name it. It's a spirit of competition. It's a slavery mentality. It's a northern mentality. It's a hazardous faith. It has got nothing to do with the sons of God. Because sons of God understand that the house of Father has got everything they need. And they don't need to wake up at 4. I'm not saying don't wake up at 4. You can if you want. You can even wake up at one if you want. I don't really care. But when you wake up, don't claim it and name it as if your father in heaven is a thug. He's not a thug. He's not a thug. You don't need to claim it and name it. Your heavenly father is not a thug. 
he is a father and he loves giving he loves giving he loves giving he's our father he's our father so hustler spirit equation hustler faith equation you cannot exhaust his house you can't you cannot exhaust his property you can't he owns everything you can see including you he owns everything it's a bad spirit it is superstition. It is witchcraft that is packaged in biblical language. You see that religious faith cannot stand in the face of Jesus Christ. True faith will heal such a man even on a Sabbath day. True faith is not obsessed with what Moses said you must do so that, you, so that God may do this and this. No. True faith trusts in the Messiah, waits on the Messiah. He's concerned. He's concerned with our eternal life. True faith does not cripple us. True faith is, is, is not just interested in salvation that is just heavenward. True faith is also interested in, in salvation that is also or is sold or that touches people. It's true faith. So Jesus tells him, take up your bed and leave. And he takes it and he leaves. But the religious leaders of the day get angry. They begin to persecute Jesus. And they begin to kill, to plot to kill Jesus. And by the way, this plot starts here. And eventually they will kill Jesus. Because they cannot accept his glory. They cannot accept true faith. I don't know where you sit as you listen to me this morning. I don't know. I don't know how your faith looks like. I've got no idea. But you know. You know. You know how your faith looks like. This has the last faith. It's a fiber spirit. A competition spirit. Before someone else gets that dress, I want to get it. Before someone else lives in that estate, I want to be the first one to live there. Before someone gets an A constant, I want to be the one getting it. No wonder God, no wonder God, no wonder you get those grades and then after that you go nowhere. Because God wants to teach you a lesson. Life is not about grades. Life is not about meritocracy. Life is not about who is smart and who is not. I tell you the truth. I was yesterday. In fact, yesterday I was just reading somewhere. Somewhere. The smartest people in the world are some of the most socially disabled people in the world. Our world. Can you stand up and pray? 